All right, and continuing our digital painting using freeware, using Photopea, we have our different references. And in the last video, I was showing you how to set it up within Photopea and how to start sketching it. So let's open up that PSD file and kind of go through what we need to understand. The first thing is we bring our reference images in and I make them small and in the corner. I'm right-handed, so I put it in the upper right-hand corner. And then what I did was I zoomed in on what I call a hero reference. Like the reference that, even though I'm going to be inspired by all of this, the reference that kind of gives me the, the shape and form of the thing I want to paint most. And using that hero reference, I got these shapes, right? Just this basic kind of tracing. So to review that, let me unlock this, make a duplicate of it. And I free transformed it. So in Photop, that's Option Command T, or on a PC, Option Control T. And I based this hero reference on this photo, right, which was one of the most dominant photos online of her, of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, former Supreme Court justice before she died. Right. So I just did a loose sketch there, and then I brought that sketch and made it fill my canvas size. Now my canvas size is large enough for printing and that is 11 by 14 inches by 350 pixels per inch, because that let, lets me print even to the largest size of 16 by 20. It's still a pretty decent resolution if I want to. Because I'm going to go through all the work of digitally painting it. I might as well do it at a, a high quality resolution. So that's how I got this sketch. The next step was to fill it in with some base color. Now, I still have a lot to do here, but base color is the type of color that you'll see in my exhaustive explanation of digital color, of digital painting, that you get to right after you've sketched, right? So even if you skip the line sketching and you just go to, to using shapes, like speed painting or, or shape painting, you have to block in everything at the base of your painting pretty quickly. It just depends how complex you want it to be. And so we're going to do a base painting layer, which will get us up to about this step. And then we're going to do an additional refined painting layer. Now, the difference between those two is the opacity and the type of brush I use. So, so far, I've just been using a built-in brush in Photop for base. And I'll turn on the gray background because that shows me how much I still need to paint. And I go to the brush tool. And the, the brush that I've been using is this one, the top right, it's round, noisy marker. And I'm using it at 100% opacity, 100% flow. I have all my other layers locked. And I'm just going to use that to roughly build things in. I'm going to make it pressure sensitive for size, not opacity. And I'm going to make it a little bit smaller, maybe around... 250 pixels. There we go. Now, when I'm doing a base painting, it's nice to have my hero reference available. And so I can actually have a few of them open. So I'm going to do that. I had this one open before, and I just keep it open in preview in the background. And I can just do a quick little screen grab of this. And have that open. And then I can also have some of these others. So this is an interesting one because it really pushes the colors in different ways. And I can also play with it. This was an AI generated one when I said Ruth Bader Ginsburg is painted by Vincent van Gogh. 
but I can play with the saturation of the colors, the temperature of the colors. And if I really want to push it, I can even open this up in Photo P. I'll just open a new browser here, photop.com, our new uh, tab in my browser. Bring it in. Because sometimes you want to mess with your reference, too. Go to Adjustments, go to Hue Saturation, and really just play with different ways that you can mix these colors. What's going to be most inspiring? I can even limit it, so now I can just take the reds and just play with those. Take the greens. Take the cyans. I'm going to push them different ways. Take the yellows. Just to get a lot of kind of tonal things to play with. This is looking, everything's very saturated. It's looking like a 3D model's kind of natural map. But it kind of shows me, it's almost like how the Predator would see Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> so if I save that, that might be a more interesting reference than just what the AI came up with, right? So I'm going to have that open along with my, my hero reference that I saved to my desktop. So I'm just going to have both of these open off to the side of my screen in preview. Let's shrink this one a little. And so it's it's kind of the photos taped up to my to my canvas. So now when I paint with my base color, and I'm just using my basic brush, I can hold down Option to steal colors. And I'm going to steal them from all my references. And I'm just trying to get rid of that middle gray in the background. And not being afraid of color, obviously, as you can tell from my face colors that I've chosen so far. Now I'm using a bigger brush than I was using around the eyes because now it's really just about kind of filling in space. And it is pressure sensitive, so if, if I want it to be a smaller brush, I can just press a little lighter. And I do want to establish some darks, but I don't want to use solid black. So that's why I steal from reference, because photographs aren't solid black. Digital art is not solid black most of the time. His, our historical paintings don't use solid black. You want it to have some sort of variation. And if you check it, you'll see that I'm not actually using black. I'm using kind of a bluish, about 70% black. I call these chromatic grays. And then I can use this as inspiration for some of the little color notes I might want to put for her cheekbones, around her nose. It's great doing portraits of older people because they have so much to their face, so much character, so much shape. You can always exaggerate people's features and do kind of caricatures of them. But if you're trying to do someone that just has kind of flawless features, that's a pretty difficult thing to paint because there's just not a whole lot to, to map your observations to. Now, we're trying to not rotoscope. Rotoscoping would be just painting right on top of a photo reference. And that's so we get more of our personality to kind of come through with this. And I'm working at 100% opacity. So every line I put down replaces what's underneath it. So this is not a way to get a lot of detail, and it's not a way to blend. It's just a way to 
give us a base. And that's why it's our base color. But where that sketch really comes in handy is noticing, like, for instance, to show her age, how big the ears are, right? Because ears and noses grow consistently throughout your life because they're cartilage, not bone. So a signifier of age would be the, the size of the ears as centered on the eye line and the nose line. And then the nose just kind of grows and protrudes out from the face more and more as you age, if you're lucky enough to age. So that's another signifier. And so sometimes these kind of spacings we don't pay enough attention to in terms of likeness unless we kind of map them out with a sketch ahead of time. Now, some of you might be interested in portrait painting. This is not a portrait painting class. You know, this is a digital art class. But in this kind of introduction to digital painting, I can give you some portrait painting basics that might help you, especially to, to help catch, if you're doing a portrait, if your proportions are, are getting off or are wrong. And so these were structures that I've learned that came from the ancient Romans because portraiture was incredibly important to the ancient Romans for political reasons. And being an oligarchy turning into an empire, politics was quite important and influence generation upon generation. Going to get the turquoise of her earring. I like that detail. Shows her interest in fashion. So, let me teach you a little bit about portraits. So I'll just call this the standard Roman portrait template as it was taught to me. And then there are tons of variations on this in portrait painting books, or portrait drawing books, or caricature books. But I'll just do it in this upper right-hand corner in case it might be helpful to you. And I'll do it in a dark blue. Okay, so I'm gonna make my brush a little bit smaller, but I'll keep the same brush. So a human head is shaped like an egg. And just like chicken eggs at the store, you would know if an egg was too round or too long to look like a chicken egg. So a human head is kind of like that from the front. That's kind of a believable egg shape. But it's helpful to, to build that with two different basic shapes. And one is the circle for the cranium, like we learned when we were doing our creature designs. And I find it helpful just to be really sketchy, not to try to draw a perfect circle, but to do kind of a lot of sketchy lines to get close to one. And then the mandible. And the mandible is an oval that kind of stretches out and thins as it goes deeper. And it's the jaw that we add onto that circular cranium. That's our, our jawbone, and the cranium is the, the dome of skull that protects our brain. So this is a human head from the front. Then we split that down the middle because in Greek aesthetics for beauty, which informed Roman aesthetics for portraiture, still informs our cultural aesthetics of what beauty looks like. It's based on bilateral symmetry. So you cut it in half that way, then you also cut it in half this way. Because if the person is looking straight at us, as most Roman, uh, as most Roman funeral portraits were, because these templates were used to, to carve Sarcophagi, sarcophagi for, for Roman notables, they would carve them from the front, right? So this is the eye line, this middle line. That's a common mistake if you're just drawing people thinking what you see, is her eyes are actually halfway between the top of her skull and the bottom of her mandible. It looks like they're higher, but that's because the hairline is covering up part of that, right? So the eye line is center, halfway from the top of the skull and halfway from the bottom of the skull. Then the eye line is split across into five equal spaces. So one easy way to do that is to try to go a little bit of distance from that center line 